So good afternoon and greetings from Malawi. Um, I'm Mia Krampen and I've been invited to talk to you about longitudinal population study in sub-Saharan Africa. I've been living and working in Malawi since 1998 uh, for the first 15 years in rural Karonga district where we conduct very long-term population studies uh, with some people participating since 1979. And since 2013, I've been in the capital city, Lilongwe, where we're establishing another longitudinal study in a highly urban area. So I'm particularly going to focus on low-income Africa, uh, where the data gap is largest and the infrastructure poorest. And I'll mainly be considering long-term conditions, which represent the biggest health challenge that low-income countries are currently facing. Uh, while of course still grappling with the huge burden of acute infections, including the current pandemic, and poor maternal and early infant health. I'll also highlight some contrasts with health and cohorts in high income settings, such as the UK, where I think most of you are working. So let's first take an overview of the questions I plan to take us through today. So to understand the context of population-based longitudinal studies in uh, low income countries in sub-Saharan sub Africa, we'll look first at the population the role of different conditions and the health service provision. Then we'll look through some of the challenges of sustaining large population cohorts, particularly in low income settings. We'll then look at existing large population based longitudinal studies and visions for the futures. And in, in most cases where an example is required, I'll aim to provide insights from Malawi, drawing on what I've learned from 23 years of working closely with field teams and international research networks in particular on population studies. So firstly, how are populations changing in low-income countries in sub-Saharan Africa? I'm sure, sure you've seen these typical population pyramids for developing countries. And I give Malawi um, as an example. You can see that there's been changes um, all the way through from 1990 to 2017. And then there's a projection from the future. So from 1990 to 2000, you can see there was actually a thinning out of the adult population due to the ravages of HIV. But by 2017, the proportion of population who are adult and older adults was growing with projections that by 2050, if current decreases in birth rates and improved later life survival increases, the proportion of older adults will be increased hugely. And this is combined with a doubling of population size every 30 years. You can see from 1990 to 2017, it doubles, and then again projected to double by 2050. This is in contrast to the type of population pyramid that you see in the UK, which may still be quite a way off uh, for Malawi. So what's the emerging importance of long-term conditions and what are the issues in the health service response to this? Combined with this aging population, the distribution of diseases is changing. These are global burden of disease estimates for disability adjusted life years lost by condition, largely based on cross-sectional surveys, hospital level data, and borrowed data from neighboring countries. But I think they're still important as an overall picture of how we think uh, conditions are impacting on Africa. So the top two um, graphics represent the contribution of different conditions to life years lost for all ages and for then ages 50 to 69. And then 20 years later in that 2019, again, um, all ages and ages 50 to 69. And you can see that the contribution of the ones in blue, which are the non-communicable diseases, which are mostly chronic, they include cancers, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cirrhosis, depression, anxiety, and so on. It's increasing both for elderly people uh, or older people, um, and also as a proportion of life years lost for all ages. And even in the infectious diseases, which are the uh, bits highlighted in red, you can see that HIV, which is another chronic condition, is by far and away uh, the most important contributor. I've just 
superimposed uh, the UK data for ages 50 to 69 for 2019. So you can see that uh, for comparison. And how does the ability of the health service to, uh, to respond differ? Well, as you, this is a, a graphic from the WHO Health Expenditure Report uh, for 2019, um, showing healthcare spending per capita um, in dollars. And you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that band across the middle, um, is representing most of the countries where healthcare spending is less than $50 per capita um, compared to uh, wealthier nations in the North. This is combined with a huge difference in the distribution of funds. You can see that in low income countries and note that the um, uh, Y axis has very different scales up to $40 for low income countries up to $2,500 for high income countries. And you can see that the poorer the country, the bigger the uh, contribution of out of ex pocket expenditure um, and donor funds compared to government spending. These two facts in combination, the low overall spend and the huge contribution contribution of out of pocket expenditure means that particularly for long term conditions, it can result in catastrophic healthcare expenditure um, for individuals and households. But the distribution of these funds uh, don't even represent or mirror the greatest need. This is taken from the Malawi uh, Lancet Non-Communicable Diseases and Injuries and Poverty uh, Commission report. And you can see the NCDIs on the right-hand side, um, although responsible for a big proportion of um, DALIs lost and a, and a large proportion of healthcare spending have very little programmatic funding um, and no um, donor funds allocated. So given these huge problems, what is the role of large population-based longitudinal studies? Obviously, for those of you working on uh, these types of studies, uh, I'm preaching to the converted, and I think that will probably be most of you. But it's, it's clear that some of the disease burden we see in low-income sub-Saharan Africa is frankly baffling and goes against much of the received wisdom from high-income countries in the West. And I'm picking these contradictions and understanding when and how to best intervene to prevent long-term morbidity is key. And this requires large sample sizes and long-term follow-up. A good example is the dual burden of malnutrition. So if you look at um, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a setting where more than 30% of under fives are stunted representing undernutrition. And yet it coexists with maternal overweight and obesity in the same populations and frequently in the same families. But all of the data presented so far across sectional in nature are very conjectural, i.e. the uh, DALI estimates, and highlight the burden without giving any clues to the interactions and the life course. So understanding the health trajectories and where and how to intervene to reduce the health impacts of these conditions requires long-term studies and careful phenotyping. And I give as an example here a conceptual model relating to a study of early life severe acute malnutrition and later NCDs, which is being led by Marco Kerak at LSHTM, including our Malawi cohorts, uh, with others in Jamaica, and some very interesting famine cohorts in Ethiopia dating from the 1980s. And you can see understanding all these complexities of the exposures um, combined with suboptimal management, um, later life risk factors to understand why we see such a high rate of NCDs in these populations. You need to understand this life course context. So I think we probably all agree that they're essential, but what are the challenges in, in establishing these and creating these resources in a way that has maximal efficiency in generating data um, and biorepositories. We of course need to ensure that the rights and welfare of the participants and the research communities in the low income settings are also paramount. 
Some of the challenges that are present for all population-based longitudinal studies are particularly exacerbated in low-income settings. I think we all know the challenge of securing funding, um, but particularly in low-income settings, it's obviously he often heavily dependent on donors and research funding organisations. The work is often more expensive and it becomes much harder to sustain it. Another key example is the lack of routine data sources on denominators or exposures and outcomes that result in a model where instead of being able to pick nationally representative samples, de detailed geographically defined populations instead are studied with data collected directly from households and individuals with field teams. Some of the consequences of these challenges mean that it often results in smaller and shorter studies that are not powered to look at rarer conditions, uh, even common cancers, or to allow subgroup analyses to understand risk profiles. The selection retention biases also need careful consideration, and the ultimate outcome is that the delays in generating high quality data that are translatable for public health impact. These different models are not always negative. The inclusion of whole communities gives a very good understanding of the cluster, clustering of conditions. It gives an extraordinary detail on the denominator populations, which may be less prone to selection bias than self-selected respondents, who typically in high-income countries may represent healthier, more educated people and underrepresent minority and disadvantaged groups. And also typically when these platforms are actually up and running in low income settings, so the capacity to net nest in-depth studies and interventions is exciting. So we do already have some existing relatively large population-based longitudinal studies in Sub-Saharan Africa, predominantly established to study infectious diseases, including vaccine preventable diseases, HIV, malaria, and other infections of public health importance. This map, which is drawn from a welcome supported workshop that I will come to later, highlights some of these and the associated biorepositories. And you can see, however, that most of these are health and demographic surveillance surveys, which may only really be capturing demographic indices. But I would like to highlight three networks that bring together data and researchers from across the continent. There's in-depth, which for many years supported DSSs from across the globe, but predominantly Africa, with its iShare data repository. In-depth is currently quiescent, and the African Population and Health Center for Research-led Inspire Network is, is leading an East Africa plus Malawi consortium to, con uh, to continue some of that work. But also of note is the Alpha Network, which for nearly two decades, has been bringing together 10 longitudinal population-based cohorts of HIV to understand key questions through facilitated high quality data harmonization and analysis workshops. And building out of Alpha, we have the ANDLA network, the African Non-Communicable Disease Longitudinal Data Alliance, which has brought together NCD data from six of the Alpha partners to stimulate the NCD population-based longitudinal study sharing and pooled analysis of data. So what have these networks with their analysis of longitudinal data been able to tell us about long-term conditions and long-term conditions data in the last few years? Well, various in-depth analyses have been highlighting falling adult mortality across the continent for the last 10 years using cause of death data from verbal autopsies. Uh, which demonstrate growing NCD mortality. The bar chart, which has age standardized death rates by socioeconomic status, critically highlight that deaths from NCDs, predominantly uh, cardiovascular disease and cancers, are not confined to the most wealthy or rather least poor of the community. And the two-way scatter is from a paper highlighting that whatever the underlying mortality rates, um, that death rates attributed to HIV and rates attributed to NCDs in both uh, younger adults and those aged 65 plus correlate very strongly with the implication that many deaths in HIV may have contributory NCD causes. 
The ARPA network links HIV data to demographic denominator data over time and has given amazing insights into the period as HIV changed from being a fatal infection to being a long-term condition managed with HIV retrovirals. On the left, these graphics demonstrate the consistent falling of mortality in HIV positive men and women as ART programs are rolled out with the other analyses demonstrating that many of the recent gains in adult mortality and adult life expectancy in these HIV high incidence populations are due solely to the improvement in survival of HIV positive adults. The graphic on the left captures the falling incidence across the age bands in both men and women over time from 2010 to 2015 and all of the settings studied with the least success in the bottom right, which is the South African setting where the incidence has consistently been higher than the lower income settings. With the graph, as you can see, having its own scale uh, that goes up much higher than the others. So building on the Alpha Park platform, six partners with population-based NCD indicators, mostly cardiometabolic, came together to form ANDLA to explore pooling and harmonization of NCD data with a view to capitalizing on the longitudinal platforms to understand survival, cause specific mortality, and the role of traditional risk factors in this setting. As you can see from the graphic on the right, where data were put together to explore uh, CVD risk scores, uh, so that at the bottom is uh, uh, risk score Framingham and WHO risk scores, office and lab based. The intention was to be able to in future validate these using mortality data and event capture and the reality was that as you can see few sites and the, the size of the cohorts is at the top. Few sites actually had enough uh, data in all of the relevant um, factors to be able to contribute significantly as these analyses require large data sets with complete data. The cohorts were also mostly not mature enough for immediate analysis of longitudinal data with only a few years follow up after the baseline data capture, although in future these analyses will be important. But using a cross sectional approach from these three settings, the ones with adequate data sets, this graph compares the framing of office risk score i.e. using BMI, not blood lipids, by age category. And the striking result is that despite the huge differences between South Africa and Malawi in terms of socioeconomic status, there's little difference in the risk scores uh, for each age group. And also, strikingly, little difference between rural and, urban, rural and urban populations, which emphasize the need for cardiovascular disease interventions and services in poor rural communities in Africa. So these data networks show some powerful applications of harmonizing data across the region with particular strengths in mortality data, HIV data, because of the link, partly because of the linkage to very well organized and donor funded antiretroviral programs, and to a lesser extent, some cardiometabolic data. Working with these networks, however, has highlighted a far larger number of data limitations. You know, exploration of these data sources highlight the limited of data available on a broader range of long-term conditions that all contribute to multimorbidity, the lack of exposure data, the lack of long-term follow-up to some of these uh, baseline data, the small, relatively small sample size for most of the partners, and few repeat measures. There were also very few urban data or partners who had enough detailed phenotyping of individuals to be able to do some very in-depth studies. And it also highlights for those of us working these networks, some of the challenges in harmonizing data sets that were collected with tools that hadn't been uh, standardized respectively. And of course, a key limitation to the size and sustainability of cohorts is the fact that we have to operate on research funding cycles and also the capacity to link early life exposures and health, health trajectories to later life outcomes. So where do we want to go and, how, and what does the future hold? I think it's clear that in order to develop our understanding of the drivers, burden and trends in long-term conditions, we need big detailed data and long-term follow-up. 
We also need standardized methodologies to facilitate data harmonization. And we need to ensure that local ownership drives the research while being, being able to continue harnessing international funding and contributing data to international initiatives. We need to ensure that our research findings lead to positive health and social impacts in our populations by influencing policy decisions, allocation of health resources, and raising public awareness and engagement. A significant step towards this was made this time last year when Wellcome brought together major funders and leaders of population studies in Sub-Saharan Africa in a workshop where we talked about the creation of an African population cohort consortium. The aims were to design a cohort and data collection process that would be sufficiently standardized to allow pooled and comparative analyses, but retain flexibility for individual partners to nest studies of special interest. It would leverage existing infrastructure and partnerships, enhance data linkage, and take careful steps to ensure sustainability and to represent the diversity on the continent. The productive workshop produced a detailed report, and from what I understand, the funders have had further meetings and are about to announce the next steps, which will be very exciting. As part of this, the workshop reviewed existing and already funded population cohorts in Africa and link ne linked networks, which are represented on this map. And I would like you to note in particular the South African sites um, and what is labelled um, right at the bottom there, Healthy Lives, uh, which in this graphic unfortunately seems to have slipped um, from northern and central uh, Malawi into Mozambique. But it is supposed to be Malawian. So in South Africa, there's a very special case that I'd like to highlight. South Africa is, of course, a middle income country rather than a low income country, but it still has an African population uh, that includes a lot of people living in extreme poverty uh, with highly, who are highly vulnerable. But what South Africa is establishing is an exemplar to the rest of the con continent. So SAPRIN brings together three existing demographic and health surveys, which are very well established, and is in the process of establishing five more, uh, four more, sorry, um, two which will be urban, which are under de development in Cape Town and Gauteng, and two that are planned, one urban in KwaZulu-Natal, and one rural in Eastern Cape. And these will have standardized tools, um, standardized data management, shared facilities, including a biorepository. And the long-term investment is guaranteed because of the investment of the National Department of Science and Innovation and the South African Medical Research Council. And it will act as an exemplar for the rest of the continent. I'd also like to share the work that we're doing in a rather contrasting setting in Malawi, which is one of the poorest nations in, in Africa and one of the poorest nations in the world. And this is through the Healthy Lives Malawi project that has been funded through the unique uh, Welcome Longitudinal Population Studies Scheme. It links to funding from MRC, which is supporting the maternal uh, mental health aspects of a birth cohort we're establishing. So uniquely, it will create general population cohorts in geographically distinct urban and rural populations, totaling 110,000 individuals with a focus on long-term physical and mental health conditions. We've done a lot of the work, uh, preparatory work, and we're at the stage of having the final ethics approvals in place, including consent for genetic studies and creation of a biorepository. So it's led by the Malawi Epidemiology and Intervention Research Unit, which is an independent locally registered NGO, which has trustees from the Malawi Ministry of Health, Malawi College of Medicine, LSHTM and University of Glasgow. And the LPS investigators are predominantly from the Malawian institutions uh, with support from both LSHTM in Glasgow and also Edinburgh University and Bristol. What we're establishing builds on linked data and sample resources in both Karonga and Lilongwe, and Karonga dating back to 1979 and Lilongwe to 2013, including an NCD survey on over, uh, over 30,000 adults that was conducted in between 2012 and 
2013. And we have in our databases, predominantly from Karonga, over one and a half million contacts with community members already documented and hundreds of thousands of linked samples. The new funding will enhance the Karonga Demographic and Health Survey, which was established in 2002, and establish a new HDSS in a densely populated, rapidly growing urban area of Lilongwe, both of which were sites for our NCD survey. We'll monitor through our community informants, births, deaths, migrations, and conduct verbal autopsies. We'll conduct another total population survey in adults and adolescents and adults aged 15 and above, which will be about 50,000 individuals. We detailed capture of data on multiple physical and mental health conditions with interviews, examinations, and banked blood samples. And nested within this work will be a birth cohort of 8,000 families drawn from that population. So as with SAPRIN and the other linked initiatives in Africa, we will attempt uh, to in the establishment of these cohorts to ensure innovation, data linkage, harmonization, and standardization, and critically embed the capacity to respond in a timely way to new challenges, as we have done with COVID through a welcome linked initiative, or for example, to look at the health impacts of climate change. And ultimately, we will have a much greater contribution of empirical data to global research efforts. One initiative which brings these really large cohorts together is the 100,000 cohorts uh, 100,000 plus cohorts consortium, which integrates large scale cohorts to address global scientific challenges. And this is from one of the uh, recent profiles, highlighting the countries that contribute and the numbers of people who are in the cohorts that have been um, included. And as you can see, there's certain areas of the world uh, that are very underrepresented, including, including that band in uh, sub-Saharan Africa where the very low-income countries sit. And we hope that by the next time they publish this paper, there should at least be a, a representation of Malawi there. And hopefully through the welcome-led uh, initiatives for the African Population Cohorts Consortium, that may continue to expand. So there's clearly a lot of work to be done, though there has been huge progress made in the last two decades. And despite the challenges thrown in our path, there's massive commitment from the key players to respond to a long-term conditions challenge. And we do have a very clear roadmap for the way forward. So I hope I've managed to lead us through some of these critical questions and I'll be available for a question and answer session. And I hope in the audience are some key people who've been involved in these Malawi cohorts, both past and future, um, and maybe may be able to join in the discussion, um, notably Albert Dubé, Owen Nkoka, and Alison Price. So thank you for your time. <laughs>